from the Apostrophe Podcast Network. Okay, wait a second. Before we get going again. So we're at least an hour into this. I know. So maybe there's a part one and a part two. Uh, there usually is. That's the, I've been finding because the so, cover. So, and I don't want to. So where are we going to stop? I mean, we barely, we've, I haven't. We haven't gotten anywhere. This is this is, this is this is one of many we're going to have, probably. I know, but where are you going to stop? Um, when it feels right to stop. Okay, because this is getting... You're getting tired? Is that what you're saying? <sighs> God. Um, it's just, you're, you're, you're almost eloquent. Almost. All, you've, got, all, almost. you've got gold right here. Oh, Mike, you have no idea. This is going to be you've the got, primo Yeah. You've got podcast. gold. This is... I have, to, I have, we've talked about stuff that I, I've never told anybody. Well, know. Cause you know, yeah. And I'm going to sell this for a million bucks. Well, they, I, good for you. Well, I, I, no, I want to get to uh, some modern stuff. I didn't want to, I mean, you know, you that have was, to understand where you have to understand. I agree. You have to understand where something comes from before. Yeah, I, well, and I know that you've got wonderful earlier. Well, okay. Do you want me to ask you about Axl Rose? Let's talk about Axl Rose. No, exactly. Okay. I'm going to get some more water. Hours. I'm going to, I got to stand and get some water. I need some water too. Okay. We'll break. Yeah. You're surviving life. With Les Stroud. I'm working on jealousy. I'm not into hate. I'm working on anger. Cause I'm not into rage. Metallica. Beth Hart. Motley Crue, Eddie Money, Guns and Roses, Les Stroud. What do all of these huge mega superstars have in common? Well, they were all produced by Mike Klink. In this part two of my chat with Mike, we go to the famous record plant studios in the 1970s, where an insane amount of incredibly popular music was made. And Mike was there for it all, albeit with very humble beginnings. Listen to how insightful Mike was, even back then in his 20s, when it came to navigating an intense and powerful entertainment world filled with rock music's biggest stars. These are the continuing words of Mike Klink. Music today is much more disposable than it was in those days because there's so much of it. If there was a reason to love a place so pure Opportunities are different than uh, a career. I wanted a career and not just the opportunity to do something one time. I'm recording now, and so well, I'm going to leave this in so I can no, assure people that this is Mike. how it works with Mike Clank. Every time I have something no. going, he's, he, he informs me of how I should be doing it better. Yeah. I got good ideas. Even though he's wrong most I of the time. I got great ideas. <laughs> Where are my headphones? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you had headphones on right now, you'd be commenting about the the sound yeah. quality, saying, Les, why don't you have a yeah. high-pass filter on this? Yeah, I would. All right. All right. So where, be, where were we? Um, what I, okay, we need, to, we need to follow the thread a little here, uh, a little bit longer, because we have you in the record plant, which, of course, for anybody who knows anything about music, their jaws are dropping at the moment going, and th with envy. Jaws are dropping with envy. Oh, you, you were young, and you were working as a, at the front desk in the record plant in that era? Yeah, when I you mean, had Buddy incredible. Miles walking in, Keith Moon walking in. Uh, the Eagles, Stephen Stills, Peter Frampton, everybody. I mean, the creme de la creme. I mean, it's back in those days, it cost a minimum of a million dollars per room for all the gear, the build out. You had to have some money to build a studio like that. And you had to have a decent budget supplied by a record label in order to get into those rooms. Those rooms were really not available. They were on occasion to people walking in off the streets. I mean, that people just couldn't afford to do it. And 
the other side of the coin is is that the record labels owned all the distribution. So it wasn't like today where you can go and record something and then put it up on iTunes through some digital distribution options. So you may record a record, but it was a vanity project that you played for your parents. And it was a 45 or an album or, you know, later on a cassette. But uh, this was even in those days way before CDs. Maybe I'm getting this wrong from you. So you will correct me when I'm wrong, because I know that. It doesn't sound to me, though, like you're lamenting the loss of that time. It's more, I feel like you take, take the progression of music in stride. It was what it was as it was at the time. And even though you, I think you and I could commiserate a lot when it comes to the way things are marketed now, but that's different. The way things music is made, you seem to have kept pace, like kept step with it. Well, you have to. I mean, I... For an old guy, I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. But, you know, I, 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 I will admit that I went kicking and screaming into the uh, digital age, but it got to the point where it was so laborious to do everything onto tape uh, through an analog console. And I was seeing people around me, you know, pulling up mixes in five minutes, as opposed to me spending four hours to recreate a mix that I had done and transferring things back and forth through Pro Tools, you know, digital, recording it uh, digitally, and then bouncing it back to analog. Just the time. I mean, I, the, the last record I did halfway i did half of it on tape and then half of it on uh in digital was uh the motley crew record that i did and the hours and hours and hours that we spent transferring things back and forth it just in the long run i just don't know if it was worth it that was the last record that i did uh to tape which album which album was uh it was uh called new tattoo was was the record did you sorry inter, uh, in, sort of an interruption question did you notice a difference in how you related to the musicians with the change into digital did that change anything no not at all because i mean to me pro tools is just a storage device just like uh, a tape machine so i try to keep the technology out of the equation when i'm dealing with an artist i try to deal with them only uh, from a uh, creative and a performance aspect and keep the technology part of it away from them. I don't want them to sit there and listen to, uh, you know, me work on editing a vocal or tuning a vocal or editing a, a drum part or this or that. I want them to be able to hear it fresh and enjoy it and not have to be burdened by the process. This is a non sequitur. There's two kinds of individuals that might listen to, the, to you and to this when they see your name. One is going to be music industry professionals, and the other are going to be music fans who just know the work that you've done. For the fans, give me, I'd love to go back into the color of rubbing shoulders with people like uh, Stevie Wonder. In that era, what, what was the ambiance? What was the, the, the human feel like? Were you living with Joe Walsh yet? Uh, what kind of, you know, what was going on in a personal level in that era? Oh, I mean, I, I was a kid. I mean, I was in my 20s and uh, young 20s. I was lucky enough to be able to know Joe Walsh, and, and he was very supportive putting me up. I mean, I moved to Los Angeles with a suitcase. and uh, Well, how did you... Was and, he where you first lived? Or? No, no. I met him through his girlfriend, who was one of my good friends from Illinois. And then I met him in, in Springfield, Illinois, on a show. And I guess I didn't annoy him. So I had an opportunity to come out here. And, uh, you know, he put me up at his place for a while. And I helped him with contracting a house and, and helping him. He was moving into a new house and having it remodeled. So I helped him in between uh, and doing odd jobs and this and that. And, and then finally one day he said, hey, you can't do this forever. So what would you like to do? And he offered me several different opportunities or ideas to get my feet off the ground and to get him out of his house. I only wanted to do one thing because from the time I was in high school, I only wanted one job and that was to work at the record plant wow. because I had seen record plant on the names of 
all my favorite records, and that's the only thing I wanted to do. Even though some of the other opportunities were pretty nice, I don't know where they would have led, but to be able to get into the record plant, I mean, all he did, he didn't offer me a job. He just offered me an interview. He called up the owner to get me an interview. In fact, in that first interview, the owner, Chris Stone, said, hey, Mike, I really like you. I like what you have to say. I don't have anything for you. I don't have any jobs. Those jobs were coveted. When people got into that situation, I mean, there there were maybe, you know, four jobs a year, and he probably had hundreds and hundreds of applicants. So he said, well, you know, leave all your information with the studio manager, which was next door to his office. And in those days, I didn't even, even have a resume. I'm sure people made resumes, but I didn't have one. I just so he walked into her office and gave my contact information. She says, well, you know, we don't have any full-time opportunities, but we do have a part-time job answering the phones on the weekends. And that's, I said, I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. No second thought. She goes, well, you start this weekend. I go, okay. And that weekend I worked 40 hours and I thought, wow, that's a part-time job here. And in actuality, yes, that's a part-time job because when you get into this business, it's full-time. It's full-time means 80 hours a week. If you like this conversation, then you will love going back into my season one of Surviving Life with Les Stroud for the start of this conversation with Mike Clank, part one. Or check out my interview with musician and poet Bruce Coburn, also in season one of Surviving Life with Les Stroud. In part one with Mike Clank, I think I played Mike's favorite song from our new, soon-to-be-released double vinyl album, Mother Earth. It was the song, When It's Gone. So this time, I thought I'd feature the very first song written for the album, co-written with my good friend Brian Potvin from the Northern Pikes. This is Arctic Mistress.
Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime. You're surviving life with Les Stroud. I want to dip back into about the self-awareness of this moment, of this time. You were self-aware enough to say, and, and non-egotistical enough to say, yeah, I'll, I'll answer the phone. Yeah, I'll, I'll just stay 40 hours. I'll just do this. You seem to be self-aware enough to say no to big opportunities when you felt they were, I guess, premature for you to take them. Why? Where's that? What, what is that? Where'd you get that? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think it's just the way I grew up and, and, you know, I really don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. So I, maybe it's the fact that at least as far as turning down some of the productions, I had seen too many people fail. So I, I, I guess that's the, the correct answer. I had seen too many one hit wonders or one miss wonders, so to speak. I had seen people bite off more than they could chew because they did get into uh, a situation that they couldn't handle. And I thought, I'm not going to let that happen to me. As tempting as it was to instantly be able to make a lot of money and be in a position of power for that moment, I knew that it wasn't there was no longevity in it. It was just an opportunity as opposed to a career. Sounds and that's, like a, an opportunity to fail. Yeah. And yeah. it's, and you know, opportunities are different than uh, a career. I wanted a career and not just the opportunity to do something one time. What was the first thing that changed all that? When, when, when did you make the leap? So I was working, I was an employee of the record plan. And what happened is when you finally decided to go out on your own, you couldn't come back. Chris Chris had this rule that once you left as an employee of the record plant, you couldn't come back. You were a bird taken off out from the nest. And, you know, God bless you. You're leaving. And I hope it all works out because don't come back here, you know, because he's already filled. The, the day you leave, he's already filled that job. So I had worked on Survivor's very first record when they were signed to Atlantic Records. And I got on with the band. We used to go out every weekend, spend the weekends down at the beach and go riding and this and that. And, what was your role on the record? Uh, I was the assistant engineer. I was okay. working behind uh, a producer engineer at the time. And I think that was in 1978. So fast forward to in the uh, early 80s, I think maybe 1980, I got a call from the band hey, would you like to uh, work on our, our record with us? And at that time, it was their third record. They were signed to a different label. And I said, sure. So knowing that I couldn't come back, you know, I signed up to do the record. And, and uh, I had a partner, Phil Bonanno from Chicago, who I had known previously, who worked at CRC, Chicago Recording Company. So I felt comfortable with him. I felt comfortable with the band. I didn't know what was going to happen. It ended up being the third record for them, which at the time we didn't know, which became Eye of the Tiger. So I left. I was uh, a hot commodity after that record hit. Well, how did, how did, did you know it was going for the Rocky movie? The no, Rocky that's soundtrack? what I'm saying. We didn't know at that time. It was, it was just a song. Well, no, they didn't. That song wasn't part of the selection of songs for when we started that record. That opportunity presented itself in the middle of the record. Stallone had called and said, you know, we need a song. And Frankie and Jim Peterick submitted the song. Stallone loved it. Well, well, that, back up a second, though. How did Stallone come to call you guys? How did because that just, he was... Sounds uh, random. Stallone was very good friends with the uh, record label, uh, Scotty Brothers Records. Mm. So there was a relationship, you know, they, someone had probably said, hey, you know, we're doing, hey, we're doing the movie now, you know, so we, uh, we're looking for a song, eh? To my knowledge, there were several different songs that were submitted by different people, but that's the one that uh, Stallone liked because they had seen a rough cut or a script of the, uh, the film and one of the things that 
in the film, you know, Rocky Balboa says, or, or the trainer, you need the eye of the tiger. And that was just that little gem, just that little statement was something that Jim Peterick, who wrote the lyrics to that song, goes, oh, yeah, the eye of the tiger. That sounds, that sounds like something that I could write a song about. Hmm. I'm, I'm just, you know, I never really thought about this before, but it's crafted pretty well for a movie about boxing. I mean, that, uh, uh, I mean, it's hits. Yeah. It's like somebody punching. Yeah. And, and it was, even in the punching speed of somebody boxing, actually. Yeah. As I said, it was written for the movie. And I was lucky enough to be able to go down to the soundstage. At, uh, we were at the Warner Brothers soundstage. I don't know if it, the film was released on Warner Brothers, but met with Stallone several different times in post and really got to talk to the guy. It was it was crazy. It was so much fun, you know. But once again, back to your point, meeting Stallone was fun. It was one of the highlights of my life, but it wasn't meeting Stevie Wonder. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your role on uh, Eye of the Tiger? Uh, I was the engineer. Um, I really co-produced the record with uh, the guys in the band. I didn't get credit for it, but that's basically what I did because I was making decisions on an hourly basis and helping to create that song. So, but that's fine. That's what happens in this business. You know, you, until your role is totally defined and uh, laid out in a contract, that's, you are subjected to the, uh, the limitations of what people said. They could have offered it, but they didn't. And I'm okay with that. It sounds like you were still young at this point then too. Oh yeah. I was, yeah, I was a kid. I was, I was young. I'm still in my 20s. I mean, you have to admit, kid from the Midwest in his 20s, I'm meeting Stevie Wonder. I'm, you know, meeting, you know, Sly Stallone, going to the sound stages. And I, I really didn't even think about it. It was all part of my job. And I, I didn't really get caught up in that whole thing. It was just, just, just what I did. I never really... I didn't even think about it as being something special. I just looked at it, uh, okay, I need to be at the sound stage at 11 o'clock in the morning because we're going to lay the song into the movie. I never thought, oh my God, I'm going to, I didn't even know Stallone was going to be there, but it was fun to talk to him just as a person. You know, it wasn't like, oh my God, I didn't really know a ton about Stallone. I knew well, he, about he wasn't the actually. Movies. Sly Stallone then yet anyway. I mean, that was yeah, the beginning. Yeah, he had done a couple. He'd, well, this was his third Rocky movie, but he okay, was, correct, but, but he was are, just yeah. a guy. I mean, we were talking about clothes and talking about fitness and diets. And, you know, he mentioned to me, you know, because he saw I was a young kid who was just starting out. And, you know, he was telling me about people telling him that he couldn't amount to anything except for a plumber's assistant is what he told me. You know, he goes, yeah, I fucking showed them, didn't I? And he did. I love that. That was inspirational to me. Did you yeah. have naysayers for what you were trying to do in that? Oh, day? absolutely. Absolutely. Mind I, your place, Michael, kind of thing. I, well, I mean, mostly from a friend of mine who I went to high school with, who lived across the street. I went to junior high and high school with, who uh, lived across the street from me. The night before I left to move to California, I remember walking across the street and he goes, uh, see you in six months. And I was like, no, you, you won't see me in six months. You, you, just, you just touched on something that's actually always been really important to me. And our mutual friend, Doug Adams and I, we actually had a similar conversation because our backgrounds are so much the same. I've always been not fascinated with, but cognizant of the concept of neighborhood peer pressure. There's a, a book called, I think it's Hillbilly Elegy. And a lot of that story there is about how your family, your peers in the neighborhood in that horrible perfect period of time when you're around 20 or 18 or 21 it's like they seek to hold you back from your ridiculous dreams your stupid dreams my neighborhood was like that i i got like oh what do you think Stroud? you're too you're too good for us now to come and get high when i would say you know when i got out of all of that i would get that so obviously you've got the one buddy who said that but it di didn't sound like it that kind of negative no i didn't i didn't have people you. i didn't it didn't affect me you know it was more like eh, no you're wrong and I didn't, I didn't let it bother me. I just, I let it roll off my back. But uh, I didn't have an outward show of support for me moving to California. In fact, my mom, she was supportive of it. But I know it killed her for me to come out here. I mean, but she bought me a suitcase and uh, she bought me an alarm clock and a shaver to, to kind of move 
she didn't understand it. And I don't think she even, you know, to that point when I was telling you about when I was explaining to her what, what I did, did she understand what I did? And I don't think she ever understood what I did. I took her to the studio a few times in my career and it was just like a place to her. She didn't understand it. And she enjoyed seeing, uh, me working, I guess, no one really, no one said, oh, you go for it, except for uh, my one friend, uh, Jody, who supported me the whole way and encouraged me to move to California and do it. Being at the record plant, once I got in there, I mean, we're a family. That was that was a family. And, and I always said, Chris and, and Gary Kelgren were the parents and all the assistants and all the the runners and support staff, the traffic managers, we were a family. We everybody had every other person's back, unless you crossed the line and did something that just wasn't part of the rules and regulations. And then you quickly became an outcast because everybody wanted things to run smoothly. No one wanted to lose their job because you were lucky to be there. And you could get yourself easily into a situation that could get multiple people in trouble. I never got into a situation like that. I was very careful. You know, I had many opportunities to, you know, people asked me to, to score drugs for them. And I flat out said, no, I never did that because it just, it wasn't part of my job description. However, a lot of the people who worked at the studio did that, but I saw too many people get themselves into situations. And I never got into a situation when I was in that position to be friendly with the artists because that wasn't my job. And I found that the people that, you know, were the assistant engineers and the runners who became friends with the artist ended up getting themselves in in situations that uh, didn't work out. I find often enough, if I'm getting in with a larger group, a larger organization, and if, if one of the first or second sentences out of their mouth is, oh, we're just like a big family here, I find that that is always proven so badly wrong and it's disingenuous because it's not something you actually talk about it's not nobody has to say oh you're going to join our family when that is one big happy family yeah no we're not that's a red flag you know we were a family but we had all the family dynamics that come with it there was tension there were there were fights there was yelling and screaming you know it wasn't all kumbaya everybody's really happy and it was it was a real family with uh, heartache and and successes and failures that's what a real family is when it, when it, someone says to me we're one big happy family i go oh, this is the same as what you said that ain't true. No. There's no such thing as one big happy family because everybody has their moments. No, it's something that you do that you just did now, which is you recognize it later after the fact. You come back and say, well, man, we were like a family there. But at the time, you don't say it because, it, no. it's, again, it comes, it's disingenuous. And I've faced it a couple and, of times. Yeah, I use it as a red flag, yeah. actually. If, and we, hmm. were, you know, I mean, we were in it. We were just trying to survive. We were just... You know, we wanted to make it to the next day, to the next day, to the next project. And that's that's what we did. We were all survivors there, fighting for the next project, fighting to get a leg up and, and uh, improve ourselves every single day because it was, that was our school as well. That was a place that we were learning every day from the best of the best. And it was an opportunity that rarely presented itself to people. And I was very fortunate to be able to get in there. And if you weren't good at what you did, you didn't survive. Just because you got a job there didn't mean that you were going to be there in a week, two weeks, or a month from now. You had to be good at what you did in order to survive. And I was really good at what I did. I never, I, I rarely, if ever, messed up. And that's why people wanted to work with me because... I was there and they knew that they could count on me. I want to ask you a question about something that I think you kind of consider your spidey sense. I know that for you and I in the studio and talking about our songs, one of your spidey senses is sequencing songs. And that's great. We've had that discussion. But another one that I've noticed that you brought up before, and I know that Eddie Money is one of your biggest examples. What is it that you feel when you use that spidey sense 
that uh, this is going to be a hit. And I think you, you told me Eddie Money, for example, was one of those times where you thought, nah, you just knew. You absolutely, when, if, even if other people didn't know, you knew that was going to be big. What is it that you're, what's going on in you as a producer? I really had a sixth sense that, that Eddie was going to be a star. And I was in a situation where I was just starting out. I was the assistant on that uh, gig. The songs were incredible. And he was just, he was a character. He had it all. I mean, from that Clive Davis school of the artist has to be a star in order for it to make it. a lot of people have talent, but if you're not, if you don't have that star quality, Eddie had that star quality. I just knew it. I felt it in my bones that, and he was crazy. He was wild, but he had it. He, there was something about him. He was mesmerizing. He was entertaining you couldn't help but notice him. He was bigger than the room. He would walk into a room and you couldn't help but say, oh my God, there's something special about that guy. And that was who he was. And I just, I just knew it. But what's the feeling? Moment. So, and you who, who else have you felt that for? Or what uh, other projects? Have you uh, only one other project. And that was uh, Guns N' Roses. That was only my second prediction of, oh my God, there's, you know, there's something very special about this you know they lived and breathed that rock and roll sense and it was undeniable i just knew they were going to be successful i didn't know how successful no one did and there were more naysayers on that band than any other band i ever worked with people just said this is the biggest piece of shit i have ever heard however in my heart of hearts in fact i even told people the a and r guy tom zutat i said this band is going to be big. And that's well, that's why he signed. He goes, Mike, you're right. Yeah, I, I know they're going to be big. With Eddie and Guns N' Roses, it was nine months of marketing and uh, great management and slugging it out in order for them to hit. I mean, Eddie, I think, was three singles into it and all that Columbia Records money behind it to make it work. And Bill Graham, who was his manager, who wasn't going to give up on Eddie. Same thing with Guns N' Roses. It was Geffen Money. It was, uh, you know, Tom Zutat really believing in the band and uh, all the people behind the scenes. And Alan Niven is a manager believing in this band, knowing that they could be big and not giving up on it when people at the label were starting to second guess themselves. I don't think anyone at that label besides Tom and, and maybe uh, their publicist, Bryn, really thought that it was going to explode the way it did. I thought that they thought it would be successful, but that's a phenomenon. And nowadays it's even harder. I, I think it's almost next to impossible to predict the success of an artist because first of all, there's so many of them. There's so many artists out there. It's, it's difficult to know what people are going to, going to like. You see what I mean? That's insight. There's more yet a part three that I'm probably editing while you listen to this. And Mike's probably mixing my new album. At least he better be. My third with him at the helm of producer. Hey, Mike, I've got a new song to submit, by the way. It's called, wait for it, Sweet Eye of the Iguana. Yeah, I know, I know. It's going to be big. This podcast is, as the saying used to go, brought to you by Aggressor Adventures. Choose your adventure. Surviving Life with Les Stroud is presented by the Apostrophe Podcast Network and is mixed by Keith Ullman. You're surviving life with me, Les Stroud. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Survivor Man Les Stroud, as I have hundreds of videos there and more going up every week. From Survivor Man Archive to Bigfoot to Wild Harvesting Tips to Urban Disaster Survival. It's all there and it's all free. My brand new series, Wild Harvest, featuring local foraging and turning those wild edibles into sumptuous dishes, is now on National Geographic Asia, PBS stations in the United States, and Cottage Life Television in Canada. The brand new special, Surviving Disasters with Les Stroud, is now on a PBS station near you in the United States or on my YouTube channel. And my brand new children's book, Wild Outside, written for your kids. It's all about getting your kids into the out of doors. And it's out now. Google it. I'm an easy find on Google. For those and so much more that I produce during any given year, 
no matter what's happening on the world stage. We'll figure this life out. Together. Cue that rip and harmonica solo, Keith. Aggressor Adventures. For over 35 years, we've designed adventure vacations around the world, helping travelers experience the majesty of the oceans and the call of the wild on our dive trips, river cruises, and safaris. From the Galapagos Islands and the South Pacific to the land of the pharaohs on the Nile River, with personalized service in every vacation destination. Aggressor, adventures of a lifetime.